Hello everyone, in this video we are going to be talking about the difference between EventBridge Rules and EventBridge Scheduler. Scheduler is a pretty recent feature that just came out from AWS and there's a lot of overlap between it and Rules, so I wanted to make a video to tell you a little bit about both of these features and then compare and contrast some of the capabilities. So in terms of the agenda for this video, we're going to be talking about a bunch of things. First, I want to do a brief overview of EventBridge rules. We're going to be talking about the two major features that it has. The first one is event pattern-based invocation. And the second one is when you have recurring timer-based invocation. And then we are going to talk about EventBridge scheduler. We're going to talk about its two main features, including one-time events, and then also recurring timer-based invocations. So you may be noticing recurring timer-based invocations. That's a appearing under rules as well, what gives. No, that is not a typo. Scheduler and rules have quite a significant overlap and scheduler has improved upon rules in quite a number of ways. So I'm going to tell you all about that in this video. And then finally, we're going to do just a little bit of a compare and contrast. I'm going to talk about when you should use one over the other. All right, so that's the agenda of this video. Let's start out by talking about EventBridge rules. And we're going to start out by talking about pattern-based invocation. So with pattern-based invocation, there's three main concepts. There's events, there's rules, and there's targets. Now, events are just the types of events that are flowing into your EventBridge event bus. So that could be things like system events. System events are things that occur on your AWS account. Could be something like an EC2 auto scaling event, for example, or an EC2 machine changing into terminated state. Then there's also partner events. Partner events can be from external providers such as Datadog, Shopify, uh, PagerDuty. There's a whole bunch that are directly integrated with event bus. So you can wire up your application to listen to those events. And and then the third type is for custom events, probably the most common ones where you have a custom application and you have specific events with a certain schema that you'd like to write to your event bus. Uh, so that's what events are. They're the core models that are flowing through your event bus. And then all the way on the right hand side, we have targets and targets are just the event recipients. So they're the ones that are interested in events as they occur on your event bus. Now there's a broad range of targets that you can connect to, including a lot of AWS services like Lambda functions, SQS or something like an API gateway. This is just a subset of them. There's a whole bunch of other ones that are also supported. And so, so far we have events, which are the inputs to the system. And then we have targets, which are kind of the final state of the system. Now, how do we wire our events to specific targets? And for that, we need rules. So rules specify how events get routed within the system. And how they do that is that rules contain a pattern that matches against an incoming event, which specifies how it gets routed and which target it gets routed to. So let's take a practical example to understand all three of these concepts in action. So let's say that we've created an event bus and we have an event that looks like this. Maybe it's an e-commerce application. So we have customer ID, order state, which is pending, and we have an amount. Now with the order state here, we have pending for this event, but imagine that there's many, many other types of states like uh, delivered or shipped or canceled, things like that. And then on the other side of this, we have a Lambda function over here as a target that is interested in being invoked only when the order state is equal to pending. It doesn't want to be invoked when the order state is created or delivered or shipped or canceled, anything like that. It only wants to be invoked when pending is contained within that event. So how would we wire up that configuration to make it happen? So what we would have to do is in advance, we would go to our event bus and say, I want to create a rule. And within this rule, we need to encode it such that it can detect when the order state is equal to pending. And if that condition is true, it's gonna forward that event to our Lambda function and in turn invoke that Lambda function. We would need to create a pattern and the pattern for that rule looks something like this. So it's a JSON object with a detail key and then within detail there's order state which equals to pending. So using this configuration, anytime an event comes in that has an order state equal to pending, it's gonna route it to our target which is our Lambda function here. So as you would imagine when this event comes in now and gets submitted to the event bus, the rule is going to parse the incoming event, it's going to see that the order state is actually pending, and then it's going to trigger our Lambda function. This feature is unique to rules and you cannot do it with schedules. So this is kind of what makes EventBridge rules a little bit unique. You'll see in the other sections, uh, there's quite a bit of overlap between the next thing that I'm about to talk about 
and with EventBridge schedules. So let's talk about that now, some of the other features of EventBridge rules. And the main one is this concept called timer-based invocation. So doing things on a certain timer or triggering an event on a certain timer. That's the name of the game in terms of what we're talking about here. Now there's two ways that you can trigger events on a timer with EventBridge rules. The first way is using a concept called rate. And the second way is using a concept called cron. So let's talk about rate first. So rate allows you to trigger an event every X minutes, hours, or days. You can specify however many minutes, hours, or days that you would like to wait. So for example, you can set up an event that triggers every one minute or five minutes or one hour or 30 days. Really useful for applications that, for example, maybe you need to do a database backup uh, every 30 days, for example. You could set this up with a rate-based rule and say every 30 days, I wanna invoke a Lambda function that's gonna take a snapshot of my database. Very, very handy. Now, the other way to do timer-based invocation with EventBridge rules is using cron expressions. So those of you that are familiar with cron jobs on things like Unix already know what I'm talking about here. Uh, and this is just a trigger based on cron expressions. And a cron expression just gives you a whole bunch more flexibility over the rate counterpart. So for example, you can define a cron expression that looks like this. And what this expression is saying is that every day at noon, I would like to trigger a certain target. So a lot more flexibility out of using cron over something like rate because you can specify the actual time period when you would like to invoke your target at noon or midnight uh, in an example like this one. Now, two main limitations about using rules with timer-based invocations. Uh, the first is that the event payload is fixed. So what that means is that when you set up your rule using either rate or cron, you need to provide a JSON input. And that JSON input is going to be passed to the target whenever the timer fires. So for example, if we create a one minute uh, rate based trigger, we're going to need to provide it with a payload. So payload is just what's inside the event. And every one minute, it's going to pass that payload to our target, which could be a Lambda function in this case. And so you can't change that payload dynamically. That's kind of what I'm trying to say here. So the event payload is fixed and it can't be dynamically set from invocation to invocation. So just a limitation to know about. Uh, the second one is that it does require an event bus. This is just a limitation in terms of how EventBridge rules works. Uh, all the features that it offers do require an event bus. All right, so now let's talk about EventBridge scheduler. And what you'll find is that there's a whole bunch of overlap between EventBridge scheduler and EventBridge rules, specifically with regards to rate and cron expressions. So Scheduler also supports rate and cron expressions in the exact same way as rules. However, there's a distinction, which is that it also allows you to set a start time and an end time for your schedule. So this lets you set up maybe a rate job that will trigger every one minute, but start on January 1st and end on January 31st. So it's only gonna be pinging every one minute and invoking your trigger between those two starts and end times. You can't do this with rules, and this idea is a very, very powerful one. Now that's not the super appealing factor of EventBridge Scheduler. What I think is the most interesting part about scheduler is this concept of one-time events. And one-time events are a very, very powerful concept but a very simple concept at the same time. And what it means is that it allows you to trigger a single event at a certain time that you specify and that event gets thrown out later. So why is this a powerful concept? Why is the idea of being able to just schedule an event in the future to wake up and invoke a target a powerful idea? Well, let's take a look at an example. All right, so we have one-time events here. And again, we are taking a look at an e-commerce application and say we have a timeline like this one. And on January 1st, a customer is going to place an order. So an order is placed and 21 days later or three weeks later on January 21st, we would like to send that customer an email. Maybe we wanna send them something like a discount code or some kind of thank you at some point in the future, but we want to send something 21 days after the original order is placed so that we can entice the customer to shop again. Now, how would we do this if you were not using EventBridge Scheduler? Well, it's actually kind of complicated. Um, you can use EventBridge rules. You can say, you know, set up a rule that 
wakes up every 24 hours, so every day at midnight or something, and have a database that stores all of the orders, and then it'll look at all the orders, find the ones that are 21 days old, and send all the customers an email for every single order. That'll work, but it's a lot of overhead to set this up. Very complicated for a seemingly trivial task. Now, how one-time schedules make this a lot easier is that when the order is originally placed on January 1st, what we can simply do is say, I want to create a one-time schedule for 21 days from now. And within that event, when you create it, you can pass a payload. So you can say, what is the context for this one-time event? So customer ID 123 and the email is bob at gmail.com. The reason this is important is that when the event fires on the other side, a Lambda function is going to be invoked. And the Lambda function needs context in terms of like, why am I being invoked right now? Because it's kind of like a stateless thing, right? The Lambda function doesn't know why something is calling it to trigger it. But when the one-time schedule invokes your Lambda function, it is also going to pass the payload that was originally created when you created the event. So you're going to have context now in the Lambda function in terms of why it is being invoked in the first place. And then from there, you can wire it up pretty simply to just use an email service to send Bob an email here. So this is just a simple example of one-time invocations, but this idea is very, very powerful. You'll find this need to schedule events in the future come up time and time again. And this new feature makes it super easy and clean to accomplish it. So really, really welcome this. Really excited to start using it. I have a video that shows you how to set this up if you're interested in learning more. Um, now, there's a couple other features with EventBridge Scheduler that make it better than EventBridge rules. Uh, so let's talk about that now. Now, the first one is this idea of flexible time windows. So flexible time windows make it easier for you to stagger events. Uh, some of the problems that people were seeing when using EventBridge rules is, say you have like a whole bunch of targets that are subscribed to your EventBridge rule. When the rule fires, all of them are going to get triggered at once. So if you have like 50 different subscriptions or something, they're all going to be invoked at once. And that can cause some problems in terms of uh, stability in the system. So say, for example, you create an event that will trigger every one hour. You can create a flexible time window of 15 minutes. And this will make it so that the targets will be invoked within 15 minutes after the scheduled time. So that's a useful feature that allows you to stagger the invocation to your targets. Now, Scheduler also supports this notion of automatic retries. So when you're creating your schedule, you can say whether or not you want to enable retries. You can say you want to retry up to three times, five times, a hundred times. Uh, and you can also set a duration to wait as a maximum. So maybe you want to try up to 10 times within the next 48 hours. And and scheduler, if it can't invoke your target at any one point in time, it'll keep on retrying over and over again until it can. Also related to that is a feature called dead letter queues or DLQs. I have another whole video on this as well. And the idea is that if scheduler cannot trigger your target and it retries up to the maximum amount of set times, then it's just going to put your messages in a dead letter queue, which is kind of like just a holding area for messages until you figure out what you want to do with them. So that's what EventBridge Scheduler offers. I want to briefly talk about when you should use one over the other, rules or scheduler, that is. And the general guidance that I have for you is that you should use EventBridge Scheduler for all things timer related. So if you want to schedule either rate or cron based, I would highly suggest you to use EventBridge Scheduler over rules. And if you want to use one time events, then you have to use Scheduler. So uh, you don't really have a choice there. With EventBridge rules, it also supports that kind of dynamic routing that we talked about in the beginning of the video. That's a reason to use EventBridge rules. Scheduler does not support that. So if you want the ability to route events to certain targets based on the contents of the event, then you'll want to use scheduler in that case. However, like there's a lot of overlap, right, between scheduler and rules in terms of that timer based stuff. Now, I do think that for timer based invocations, rules are kind of going to be made redundant. And the clue is within the AWS console itself. So here's the console experience of defining a rule. So I was trying to create a rule in the console here. And so I wanted to create one using a schedule, right, using kind of a recurring timer like we, like we talked about. And you'll see whenever I select schedule under EventBridge rules, it automatically tells me, hey, EventBridge scheduler, a new AWS scheduling capability is now offered. Do you want to use that? And even the way the UI is laid out, like in order to continue to use rule, it's faded out in the bottom left, whereas in the bottom right, it's a nice orange button and it's trying to kind of push you to use EventBridge scheduler for this type of use case. So it seems like AWS is trying to push everyone in the direction of, of EventBridge scheduler and 
general. So it's something that I think they're going to continue to invest in. So I hope this video was useful. Check out this other one on how to set up Eventbridge Scheduler and create a one-time event right here. And I'll see you next time.